let, let me start off with one or two points. I've got lots of points. But firstly, I thought you made a very important point. Unfortunately, the manifesto is not, the page is not numbered. But on page three, as I've numbered it, which is a substantive part, you say that innovation is to be seen as a political and not an economic or technological process. I thought that was very important. But if that is so, and if that's what the point we start off with, then I have to say that the politics of the manifesto as it currently is, is deeply troubling. Um, there are various statements, for instance, I won't go into detail, that on page 7 you say that the categorization of countries in the world into developed and developing are obsolete categories. I'm not sure how you reach that conclusion. Mm -hmm. Certainly to us they're not obsolete. Yeah. And I would say the very fact that you refer to group of 7 and group of 20, and we know about the group of 77, means that there are countries are categorized, and one can give them different names, but clearly the group <coughs> of G7 are the developed countries in some sense. So I'm not quite clear why you use these categorical statements and these terms are obsolete. You also use phrases like there are diverse meanings of development flowing from many experiences of poverty and injustice. And then sometime later on the same page, you refer to this point about how different, uh, 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 seemingly irreconcilable principles can be brought together. Now I'm deeply troubled by that because it leads on to some other phrases that we use elsewhere that development can mean different things to different nations or different people. Mm -hmm. And I'm troubled by it because it sounds, I won't use the word suspiciously, but rather alarmingly similar to the notion that in fact the question of global warming has come about because there are per capita energy consumption uses in the G7 countries and if India and China were to reach those per capita yeah. levels of, con uh, of energy consumption, that would be disaster. Yeah. I can go and there are a whole number of phrases over here. The simple point I want to make is that the manifesto, I'm afraid, as it currently stands, is not acceptable certainly to me. And I would not be happy at encouraging questions that come out of it. And if it were a manifesto, for instance, one of the things that I would like to see is why global institutions like UNCTAD, like the United Nations Conf uh, on, on Transnational Corporations, why, why uh, WTO is dominating. These are the questions that we need to ask before we can get down to a true manifesto for 2010. Yeah. Um, I totally endorse uh, the CPRG's views. In the sense that you know this manifesto, I mean, if I may use the word, but it's very north centric, very north centric. A whole lot of issues have been ignored, including if I take your first question, I mean, whose sustainability are you talking about? You know, so these basic things, and then when we are forced to discuss this as a manifesto, as a given draft, a whole lot of things, as he pointed out, get left out. So I think we need to rework the whole set of questions, as it were, <coughs> including the creation of unsustainability in what you call the developing countries. But fundamentally, one has to recognize that there has been a, a seismic shift in the nature of uh, power. And it is no longer the case that uh, mm. there is unilateral, there is one power which sort of sets the agenda of everybody else, or that, uh, that, uh, that one power can have a uh, uh, people, or, I mean, carrying other smaller powers on his back in order to achieve whatever it is that is uh, their vision, imperial vision. Now, um, you were talking about the United Nations, and in fact, in the United Nations, you know, there's a book recently written about the United Nations, which said that essentially the United Nations was constituted in order to uh, uh, regain imperialism. That is to say, this was, uh, the, the victors, in fact, put themselves in the you know, Security Council as prominent members, and they were supposed to make sure that, you know, the old imperial order, I mean, return in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, um, it's pretty clear uh, that is what happened with the UN, because, the, uh, you know, the US was the supreme power, and in fact, they were able to write roughshod over even the UK uh, when it came to very critical issues. 
Um, so basically now, you know, uh, we have our problems, and of course we have a very lively internal debate about these things. A debate that actually you know, confounds many people from outside because they don't see the range of um, this sort of diversity. Because they are not, you know, essentially, I mean, I mean, uh, given all our inadequacies and, and so on, we still retain a culture of open debate. Um, and we do not have a hierarchy. There, there is no, you know, we don't have lords and ladies and whatnot. We are all citizens of India and we are. A, a equal right, and we, uh, we have chosen a, a president who is a, a woman, who, I mean, um, and it's, it's, it's a matter of great pride that we have like that meeting the Queen of England who is not elected. Uh, now, so the, the thing is that we, we need to know what your problems are and, uh, you know, where is the overlap with our problems so that we can work together to resolve each other's problems. Now, we can't reform the whole world. I mean, <laughs> And if that is to be done, you know, you have to have a different constituency. You have to have India, China, you know, various emerging economies on board. Um, so this must be treated as a purely bilateral thing, where, you know, you're, you're telling us about our difficulties. And I know what astounding things are happening in the sphere of higher education in Britain, mm -hmm. uh, because of the government, you know, the kind of policies of both the government and the Colini, you know, manner manifesto to government uh, against the new proposals on this, um, you know, higher education and whatnot. So that there, there is, um, and, and traditional ecosystems like, uh, you know, knowledge ecosystems like Oxford are threatened because of this uh, new drive towards uh, equity, which is not in itself a bad thing, but you know, the fact is that, uh, I mean, uh, there, is, uh, there is so much contention. Uh, now, we pay, pay the price in some sense because we are, we are our students are charged three times the fees of EU students and UK students. So we, we have, we are part of the common with my view, but nonetheless we have to pay three times more. Now, these things are not sustainable in the long run. So, I mean, the UK has to come to terms with, you know, uh, which is placed in the new international order. And, you know, it's not being patronizing, it's being, you know, entirely based on, you know, the economics of what is happening. And we, we find now that lots of people are coming to India. Mm -hmm. Because they are they're in search of money, they're in search of jobs, you know, they're in search of projects. Um, and this is where the action is going to be. And in, uh, you know, in, in 10 years' time, the population of Delhi will be greater than the population of the entire UK. So, you know, here we have, I mean, in fact, we should, I should again <laughs> recommend this book by Stan uh, called Delhi um, Adventures in a Mega City. Where this, uh, you know, a BBC journalist says that he would not live anywhere except in Delhi because this is a mega city. And uh, he finds that London is too provincial. <laughs> really is that. So, so let's come to, you know, think about it from the 21st century framework. You know, forget about the 20th century you know, and its hangover. And, you know, basically talk about each other's, um, you know, where is it that you need help? Where is it that we need help? And where can we go? If we frame questions on what the politics of the 1940s or 1930s were and limit ourselves to those mindsets and mind frames, we might miss out on a whole series of movements and ideas that have come through in development. If we limit ourselves to talking about people from different nationalities and hold down people to be from where their passports are from, we might lose out other social movements that have come through. Um, in terms of uh, the people from the IDS being representative of the UK and the UK alone, um, that's a, I don't know, that's for them to answer, but it might not be representative of the, the true reality. It might be uh, something mixed up in uh, perceptions that people have of their imaginary. So maybe that's to be considered. Um, and Delhi, for the record, as far as I'm concerned, the national capital region, is about 40 million people. And 40 million people is a lot bigger than many countries in the world already. And people have been coming here since centuries before, settling here, staying here. So to assume that these things again are new is an assumption. It needs to be backed up with concise historical information. Thank you. It is in all that. But at the same time, one cannot, one cannot ignore certain historical pasts. Mm. I mean, I really want, I mean, I'm glad you brought it up, but I also wish you hadn't. Because those of us who are in India here, we have felt the brunt 
I'm, I'm grateful to come up with names, but say Michael Lipton mm. and the disaster he created in the food plan. Now, say, dear, dear, would bear me hope. We have had, and that's why there are a lot of similarities coming. In 1968, we had Ehrlichman writing about the population bomb, then the singers, and I happen to have read it, 1970, this has its manifesto. I don't know how it was called radical or by who. And then you had Cochrane writing in 1971 about the world food crisis. Now, the paradigm was very similar in all these three books. And in this manifesto, I'm sorry to see you have not been able to move out of that paradigm. That's the crux. But to say that uh, everybody in India is an equal citizen, I mean, surely there's lots of discrimination here, there's a caste system, there's, uh, we, we had a whole day talking about urban poverty and the neglect of, uh, I mean, you have wonderful science and technology and innovation, but you can't even provide people's basic services and rights and water and sanitation. So surely, I mean, there are issues to think about here in terms of, you know, who is innovation serving? What is the role of science and technology? Sure, we have 40 million people in our day. Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, there, there's, there's issues to learn on, on every side. And obviously in, in the UK, there is, I mean, yeah, it'd be great to talk about some of the issues in the UK, you know, the, the culture of risk, the way science and technology is created. I think we can share, we can discuss those kind of things. But I, I just had some issues about saying, you know, there's so much equality and there's no problems here that, uh, you know, everything's hunky-dory. Sam Miller can say whatever he wants about Delhi. Well, I, I mean, I, I, nobody said that. I mean, we are not saying that we don't have problems, but we have a mechanism to take care of these things. We have a democratic society. I mean, despite all the distortions that have happened, we are still fundamentally democratic right from the top to the bottom. And, and we do not have a hierarchy. And since, you know, all of us uh, as a culture believe in education as being the central determinant to one's life, you know, life chances, Education is very important for people. They go off to places like Australia where they get beaten up, uh, you know, <laughs> when they are better in education. And, and with the B British, you know, they've suspended issuing visas to Indian students on the grounds that they might be going for something else, that they are, they, you know, doing jobs as their uh, students. Now they are considering taxes on non-DOMs, you know, people, businessmen, Indian businessmen, not resident in the UK, uh, but having homes in London and so on. I mean, these are not, these are entirely retrogressive measures and I don't see how a uh, vigilant citizenry in the UK does not take up arms against these, uh, you know, very retrograde moves. Uh, so it's unfortunate. But, you know, it, it, I mean, you see, we don't need to wash our dirty linen in public, we do it in public anyway. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but we would like to know about your dirty linen too, so. Since morning we are doing only this thing. <laughs> So they were participants in the process. But the purpose of me coming down here is that, um, frankly, I don't know all these things. I'm from the grassroots, working with people. And uh, I look at, uh, basically, uh, how to make sure the food is available to all. And then the first paragraph of your overview is what the work is all about. Uh, the entire paragraph of in 2009 to the transgress what is being said is what we are trying to do. What we definitely know is that uh, while uh, uh, the, I'm from, I mean, we are basically medical doctors working at the, the uh, grassroots, what happened in the push and pull factor of producing more doctors, doctors reaching to the rural India, not having good monitoring systems, the amount of damage they have done is much more than the, the benefits which have been there. So uh, what we are, uh, we'd like to share from our side is that uh, uh, there is a requirement to strengthen the values of which we had and the, to strengthen the values any one single value would like to take it up as individual, as an organization it's a lifetime work and then secondly when you look at uh, uh, scientific interventions I see the science and technology has uh, much more role now uh, basically looking at uh, uh, after the damage whatever the damage happens uh, we need to have a new science built up. We need to have, uh, I'm talking the context, very specific context of unnecessary surgery which are being done for the rural women. So uh, I'm just talking with my experience what, uh, or, or with what we are being exposed to. But uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the discipline of uh, acquiring knowledge and its applications, uh, there's a lot of gap. 
So uh, how best we could uh, uh, look at it. And uh, I mean, while I was reading this, I'm also, also reflecting on this. And uh, I'm just uh, I'm listening to all what they are saying. But uh, I see I have one life. I'm being trained as a medical doctor and with some heart to make sure that what all we have learned, how best we could apply judicially and best could be done. What I would definitely want for my friends over here, wherever, whatever the manifestos you are talking about, given one life what we have, what best we could deliver. So that should be sort of a convergence point. And I think uh, what all the dialogues we are going to have, the politics behind the dialogue, uh, I'm not very keen because uh, the two people who died in my life are my sister and my brother, both right of medical uh, situation which had no treatment. The, the same sister, 1983, the disease with which she died, had she been alive, she would have survived, but the technology actually improved. So uh, with pain we are in the field, what all we are doing. So I feel that uh, uh, we each one should have a larger heart and to see that how best the technology or the, the knowledge what we have procured from the institution, how best we could deliver to everybody. Thank you. Some of the perceptions about the country may not be reflected in the you know, uh, group of scientists or intellectuals that we speak to. So obviously we do understand and appreciate the spirit that you have as professional from Sussex is probably not the same as the role that British government plays in the uh, things as we see from outside. The same is probably true with our colleagues in the US or in any other country. So at that level if we talk in terms of you know, uh, intellectuals looking at the world order as it exists today or the system of innovation in the current world order as it exists today and what can we do about changing it for the better. Right? If that is the larger spirit, I see that the, the two uh, major points from the Sussex Manifesto that you mentioned, uh, development, not just growth and uh, the existing international division of labor not adequate, these are very uh, radical to some extent political positions to take and clearly expressing the dissatisfaction with the existing scheme of things. I think that, that kind of clarification and qualification of terms is required in many other parts of the document. Because, for example, in the very opening statement you say the world is ever more globalized and interconnected. Are we happy or are we not happy with the world, the globalized world as it exists today? How do we qualify globalization from a political manifesto perspective on the field. Does this manifesto see globalization as it stands today, as uh, a voluntary you know, union of sovereign nations coming uh, into an interconnected world with their own uh, choices being met, or is it a few countries imposing their agenda on the rest? That's a position that uh, a manifesto like this would have to take because a lot of you know things that happen in the technological world, in the innovation world, in the aid politics, in the fund politics, um, and even many schemes, you know, including health, uh, agriculture, uh, uh, etc. Through the so-called UN agencies and associated agencies, uh, is entirely defined by certain framework of globalization, as uh, defined by a few engineers of globalization, few countries which have played, taken upon themselves this globalization project as it were, on which many books have been written, so I don't have to repeat that. So a manifesto like this, a progressive manifesto if it wants to be, would have to take a position as, do we see this current globalization as a nice thing that happened in terms of empowerment of countries to realize their goals in an interconnected world or not? <coughs> because from there, a whole lot of arguments will start you know, uh, getting developed, uh, integrated backwards. If not, then why not? And then you know, how does one make that begin anyway? Then the question, some of the recommendations you made also become a little more clear when you say through G20 and G8, uh, G8 uh, some of the uh, intellectual property rights at national and international levels. Because then, what are those national and international levels? Do we accept the current agreements as they stand. If we don't, then from what perspective we don't? And then how do we you know, uh, go about making a difference? For example, WTO as it stands today, uh, is it something that this manifesto sees as an equitable 
global institution. It should take a position. I mean, if it were able to take uh, such positions in the uh, manifestos before, uh, it would really help uh, to take such a position. Uh, similarly, um, a manifesto of this sort, which I presume would be a, a, a manifesto not for Sussex, not for just UK, a manifesto for the world, uh, as you would like to see, should also look at you know uh, what role the international organizations, <coughs> all kinds of international organizations have played in bringing about equitable uh, development, equitable growth, equitable access to innovation, equitable access to technology, etc. Et you can start the whole range, you know, starting from Bretton Woods institutions to United Nations institutions to the whole range, and right up to the Bill Gates, Melinda Gates Foundation, etc. Et then you see a pattern there. And for anybody who, who looks at it from a reasonable you know, political economic point of view, that pattern is too obvious not to acknowledge. And uh, such a thing would immediately put it you know, in perspective. And because anyway, you started off as you know, someone who's criticized as radical, so you have nothing to lose. <laughs> You're already radical, right? You started off as radical, so might as well be radicals. Yeah. Yeah. You can't please everybody, so there's no point even trying to please everybody. Right. Right. So, uh, uh, similarly, in the Global Innovation Commission, see, uh, from a perspective uh, of the degree of globalization that you might get to read from countries in Latin America, India, uh, some parts of Southeast Asia, the term global has come to mean either uh, Anglo-American or probably more recently, america anglican you know, uh, framework of uh, how the world is seen. Because uh, increasingly one tends to see that you know, uh, by attaching the word global, a certain national perspective or a certain national government's perspective, though it's not something that you might share, becomes a, a global position. In a way, like what is good for America is good for the world. It's that kind of thing. By just putting the prefix global, any domestic agenda can become an international agenda. American national uh, intellectual property law can become the framework for TRIPS and WTO. Suddenly it becomes, you know, it's a globalization of intellectual property regime. So, uh, those things need to be uh, such examples, well, well documented examples in literature, well such examples, can be innovative to, to build a perspective and to, uh, to clarify what we mean when we use many of these terms. Terms like globalization, terms like, you know, development, terms like international organization, what do we mean by international organization? What do we mean by the role they have played? Do we think they have played the role that we'd like to see as a manifesto or not? If not, then how does one see it? Because the, the general tendency uh, uh, of the countries that have been on the receiving end of globalization, probably much of Latin America, you're seeing the kind of wave that we're seeing in the last few years, and I'm sure this is going to happen even in this part of the world. Uh, the immediate reaction for anything with the prefix global is that of suspicion. So, uh, if there is a way to preempt that suspicion by making it more you know, uh, clarified, that would really help. The other corollary of that is, where would this Global Innovation Commission be? Where should it be? If it should be truly representative of the uh, world, and of the most uh, uh, needy you know, sections or parts of the world. One would have to ask this question. If this is going to be in Washington or London or you know, Paris or any such place, uh, it would essentially replicate the same model and therefore will get the same kind of uh, suspicion that the previous global institutions have. <coughs> Nobody sees this World Bank as a global institution anymore. Nobody sees the United Security Council, uh, UN Security Council as a global institution anymore. Even WHO is now under heavy attack for the kind of roles it's playing in, in dressing up the claims of WHO and NY and for pushing certain kinds of vaccines in developing countries that don't need them. Or uh, institutional frameworks uh, uh, of, uh, for example, uh, uh, looking the other way when the public sector is uh, you know, winding up in developing countries where people don't have a capacity to pay for private sector medical services. So 
there are certain political roles that each of these organizations is playing and, and there are people at the receiving end of the role that these organizations are playing in each of these countries. Who therefore, I don't want that, uh, you know, a well-intentioned move like this should be seen as, you know, one of those lists that I mentioned before. Right? And that, that is something that you can clearly avoid, you made a beginning, and uh, uh, by just, you know, being more uh, well-qualified in our terms, we can easily you know, avoid that kind of suspicion and make some very good bridges with, uh, with uh, like-minded you know, uh, uh, colleagues in other countries. I mean, I can expand this further, but I think you've got to just so thank you. The H1N1 in India, swine flu, it did not spread to the lower cluster. It was confined only to the middle class. Had it gone to the lower cluster, things would have been entirely different. So, the, although the things are there, I still admit, but it is not uh, so much awkward or awry or off the loop because I had been actually uh, involved in this, all this matter. And I had even uh, shortlisted certain home remedies which have been distributed to around 4 lakh people. Anyway, just a clarification, WHO, some things must have swayed, but there is an element of truth in that also. No country in the world could tell the US stop exporting H1N1 infected patients to the rest of the world. I don't understand why. When the avian uh, case happened outside US, immediately the US, the WHO, the CDC, the whole international gene bank started, you know, stopping, uh, you know, air flights, changing uh, travel advisories, uh, airlifting people. They, they brought the whole world to a standstill. Day in and day out, US was exporting infected people to various countries, of course, including India. Nobody told uh, the U.S. you have no business. This is nothing short of biological warfare. Why? If it is, you know, something originating from outside U.S., then that country is responsible. China is responsible for avian flu. Mexico is responsible for something. India is responsible for something. When a disease originates largely in, in U.S., even though it was part Mexican, it's an American company which, you know, uh, which did that big farming in Mexico where it started. It should have originally been named North American Swine Flu. According to the established CDC, uh, uh, sorry, established international uh, uh, code for naming diseases from the place of their origin, it should have been named North America. Earlier they called, you know, Mexican flu, Chinese flu, etc., etc. But North America would not allow the rest of the world to call a disease by its name. This yeah. is the world order we are talking about. Flu for them is a, is a word. <laughs> this is the world order we are talking about, and we are all at the receiving end of this world order. And of course, you know, I mean, we have had a pretty visit, and of course, all the countries involved. Uh, I mean, uh, you cannot treat um, um, incidences of diseases as something that is particular to a, to a country. I mean, it, it concerns everyone. So, um, when it comes to pandemics, when it comes to threats of pandemics, it, it involves everyone. No, but the rules of the game should be the same for all. But the rules like, should be, yeah, there should be reciprocal. I mean, of exactly. course, you can't, uh, that's why sick people can't come to the US, you know, because sick people can go out of the US. But I am against, you know, any kind of quarrel, you know, sort of allowing people who are real. Uh, you know, they have human rights, so they are, they are you know, entitled to vote. They are all citizens who are coming back, so that's yeah. a different point. That's right. I mean, it's so, not coming back. Try and be a little positive, more positive. <laughs> uh, you have put a lot of efforts into this document, and some of us have expressed our, <laughs> our disappointment with the viewpoint that you have expressed in it, consciously or unconsciously. But look, I think this is the fact. We all know what we would like for every single citizen in the world. We would like them to be able to live a reasonable length of time. We do not want infant mortality rates which are as high as they are. We do not want poverty. We want people to have a proper place to sleep in and so on and so forth. There's nothing mysterious about that. And there's no real reason, I think, for anyone to debate it. It's been there in UN documents for the last 50 years. What we would have liked from you, therefore, is how do we move towards ensuring that every single citizen in the world has those particular uh, essential requirements of humanity, which are the institutions, whether we like it or not, which are preventing us. As someone pointed out, WHO has become a lobby for the transnational pharmaceutical companies. Why not come out and say that? 
Why can't you say that these organizations set up by the United Nations have been taken over by very, very, the most powerful vested interests in the world? You use a phrase somewhere that, uh, something interesting phrase you use about the existing power structure operating through existing markets, which means you're aware of these things, but it doesn't reflect in the rest of your document because there seems to be a retreat from those particular propositions when you get into the substance of the thing. I think that if there had been more of that, as somebody pointed out, that if you're going to be radical, then be truly radical. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you had done that, we would have had a basis of, a, I'm afraid, a more sound basis for having a dialogue. Then we could have agreed to agree on many things and disagree on many things. As it, I mean, listening to, to my colleagues for the last 45 minutes, and it appears as if everyone, we're going haywire because there is a <coughs> fundamental disagreement on the very base premise of, of your manifesto right now. And you know, you've come a long way, you wouldn't like you to feel that it was, it was a wasted effort. But the fact of the matter is that perhaps you can take back with you the fact that a very simple notion, if I may take two minutes longer, a nation means different, a different thing to us to what it might mean to people in the first world. In the first world nations, the nation state and nationalism have been very often the cause of war. In our country and countries like it, the nation state has been created in the course of a struggle against colonialism. So a nation means very, very different things to us in India and some other countries and it does to you. And I don't like the idea, therefore, of a statement you make that uh, the national innovation National, no, that the, the national innovation system is again obsolete and what we need to do is to have part this, in this global innovation system, you'll be linking up the global innovation system with local societies and even, even otherwise the governments will be represented alongside civil society groups. Now, quite frankly, civil society is again a very nice word, but we know that many, many of these civil society groups are funded and work in the interests of people who we don't like at all and who don't have Indian development at all at heart. So again, I come back to the fact that the phrases used here, perhaps the person the author didn't fully realize the implications in the way they resonate in countries like India. Perhaps that's not what you meant. But the reason why we're having this rather uh, not pointed discussion is I think because of people's uneasiness with this document. You didn't get it earlier, so it's a very short time, but still, uh, some of the issues that have been raised, and I agree that if, if some manifesto has to be, forget about radical, if it has to be progressive, it has to, has to question uh, accepted norms in many cases. And one of the norms that uh, here it, re it uh, gets reflected again and again is this mindset of being bound by nation state boundary of nation state, that we will work in a framework of a nation state. And uh, I don't uh, agree with some of the observations made here that we don't have hierarchies, we don't have discrimination. Because forget about uh, this India caste system, right here in Delhi, I know I live in Delhi for 17 years, the persons, large percentage of persons who drive cars and those who ride cycles, there is a discrimination, there is a hierarchy, not in the higher group, but in both groups, not in the physical symbolism, but in the minds. So we have all those problems like you have, like many other people have. So it's not a question of you have, we have, we don't have. It's not a kind of uh, back and forth kind. But another very important understanding here is all these problems, including the question of whether we uh, like we, it was used uh, very uh, appropriately, this globalization. Even in this country, if you accept again this uh, mindset of framework of working within the concept of nation state, there is a section which is in India today will be 15 percent, in China today will be 25 percent, maybe 20 percent, which is a beneficiary which is equally in the globalization uh, mode, which is uh, very happy with this globalization mode, who have vested interest in the, uh, continuing this kind of uh, globalization, quote unquote. And in terms of someone mentioned climate change, it can be shown very clearly. In today, this same section is contributing, is behaving, is in the culture of creating this problem. It's not only a question of US or Europe. It is primarily by them historically, 
But today, it is also by this segment which is happy with this globalization. So first, we will have to question whether we want to be limited by this mindset of working within the parameters of nation states. You, if you are radical, if you are progressive, a lot of people will be uncomfortable with this, but this needs to be questioned because people anywhere in the world, if there is a marginalized group, there is a discriminated group, their uh, synergies will not be bound by this constraint. And that needs to be questioned very strongly. But here, all the formulations that we have suggested, or most of the formulations, like GA, G20, are still, still stuck in the nation state framework. So all this needs to be uh, looked into again. Uh, for a global agenda on technology and science, uh, debates have moved forward a lot. Uh, and I assume that if you had taken into account the debates that are there on the issue of technology within the United States process, and particularly the submissions that various developing countries have made, G77 in China, India, Mexico, Brazil, and a number of others, then some of the questions um, or, or, or uh, the disagreements that we see, I mean, you could have uh, had a better understanding of the uh, uh, you know different opinions and perceptions and expectations and aspirations that different countries and different societies have. Um, so that's one thing that um, like I just want to be a little constructive, even though I'm like fairly disappointed with the document. And the other thing which like struck me uh, was, I it, it seems to me that there is a sort of methodological error in its approach, in the sense that you you begin with a, a, a premise that when in 1970 you had this um, manifesto, and it was for development, quote unquote. And those development challenges are still there, and new challenges have been added. And then you simply move forward, take the current challenges as given, and not going into the history of their evolution. For instance, the new challenges, you, you, you miss a very important point, is that the new challenges are the product of the very process that the 1970 manifesto, you know, the, the process of science and technology development process uh, 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 that the 1970 manifesto put in place or brought in to, you know. Uh, so the kinds of technologies that have been developed, the, the kind of, uh, uh, the, the way science policy was perceived, a lot of current problems of sustainability are a product of it. I mean, you, you cannot prop, you cannot delink the technological process, the nature of the technological process, a progress that has happened since 1970, and the growing inequities and sustainability concerns after that. There is a very strong positive link between these two, and that the recognition of that link is missing in in in, in this analysis. So unless and until you, uh, and then further. You, you keep, it, 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 this document seems to be just modifying the previous manifesto. So there is nothing really new in it. And that's, that's and, and I mean, very ironically, you, you, in, the document keeps talking about and referring to the phrases of like locked in, closed down uh, uh, systems again and again, but in its approach, the document itself, is very locked in. You know, that is very well reflected in those three questions that were put for discussion. You know, you say, okay, three major sustainability problems. I mean, to my mind, those would automatically, and in, in most likelihood, would lead back to what Brunkland Commission report says, the three key environment, poverty, and growth. I mean, that's 
that's like somewhere in the subconscious, may not be conscious, but that's there. And then you come down to the second question, what are the po whether the existing institutions, policies addressing it. Now that's the premise of your paper, that question is, is redundant, meaningless, because you start with that like, no, it's not. So, and then one very dangerous thing and misleading is this idea of diversity. Now, you're talking about locked-in approaches and how rich, powerful and resourceful elements or sections in society and politics determine, have been determining the innovation uh, process. Um, given that, I, I just, like, it's this, I, I don't understand, how do you, how, how, how can one imagine that there could be a diversity in that? You can have a diverse, you know, it's like, so there is, it, it looks like uh, there is, a, the implication of it is that there are, is going to be a segregation of, um, how to put it? Uh, okay, let me try to explain it from a simile, like in 60s when the, the there, when there was a fear that many of the developing countries, particularly in Latin America, the, the chances of social revolution were like very strong, so there was this like a lot of civil society institutions came up, a lot of money was provided as a safety wall. So it looks like that, that okay, you target the innovations, but you really do, do not address, so for rich there could be a different kind of uh, innovation system, for poor there could be a different kind of innovation system, I don't think that will work. And one last point, uh, in your presentation, I could not find that articulation in uh, the document, but in presentation, so I see that there is somewhere uh, in the thought process it is there. The use of word equitable in within distribution, you say equitable distribution, equitable distribution of benefits, risks, and costs. I mean, just give it a thought what its implications could be. But, you know, in a differentiated world, equitable cannot be equal. It has to be differential. So, what kind of formula for the differentiation of distribution of costs or benefits and risk? I mean, putting benefits, risks, costs together and equitable distribution, it's very strange. Oh, oh, one more point. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's, okay, you used that in late 1960, the late 1960s witnessed the moon landing, the burgeoning green revolution and a global smallpox eradication program. All of these raised the possibility and hope that science and technology could address the most stark of humankind's development challenge this hope was exemplified in blah, blah, blah. Now we are again witnessing coordinated international effort to solve global problems using science and technology. Now, I'm really surprised to see that there is no quotation marks in this. So all terms are fairly problematic, particularly the Green Revolution. Like, you're talking about, okay, the technology has moved forward, but there is uh, there are issues of poverty. And all. Green Revolution is a very complicated subject in that regard has to put some marks around it. Uh, you see your recommendations, you have uh, recommended to commons, industry and donors. That I suppose uh, these are the people or the agency, these forces actually did all the damage that you have outlined in your report in such a well-intentioned manner. Mm -hmm. Or somebody else has done it. If somebody else has done it, who is that? What is that force you can identify? If you think that there is a particular force which can bring about change, which can change the heart of the government, mechanics of the government, say the industry itself would change its character, the donors would change their character, what is that particular force? How is that connected to innovation process? Is the social movements anywhere in your even uh, framework? I don't see that though they, it was indicated that a lot of new social movements are coming to existence, you don't even recognize that. You don't even recognize their diversity. You don't even recognize that debate which is going on among them. 
where in fact the two points that you saw in fact are very much debated within that particular uh, world and uh, that's why there is politics, that's why there are different political parties, that's why the social movements are not yet together. So one must recognize that uh, you have missed out something very very important, the force of change. The force of change which will change governments, which will change industry, which will change donors and so on etc. that who and whom has not been identified. Because that the process itself which you have identified, if you look at that, in terms of institutions, expertise and uh, what else, governance, these three. You look at them, put in such politically neutral terms, like top down, bottom up, you know, various forms of knowledge, etc. You know, etc. You know, these uh, are very, very neutral and I am telling you this has, there has been enough incorporation of this agenda on the part of the powerful. The powerful talks of this agenda, World Bank talks of it, WTO talks of it, all these people talk of it. We must recognize they only talk of it, but they want something else to be achieved. And they have achieved it through coercion, through force, they impose the whole WTO agenda on the whole world, as far as is concerned. Now, somebody else, it wants to change the situation, there will be a process of resistance. There will be a process of building new hegemony in terms of ideas through struggles. What are those struggles? Both at the level of even creation of innovation, many of us are involved in bringing about grassroots innovation, building, nurturing, incubating those innovations. I, there's no time for it. We can, I can give you, this is an experience, 20 year rich experience where we've learned quite a lot, how to move even social movements to actually accept that agenda. How do we do it? We have that particular experience itself. That even what failures we have had, successes, we could share with you as far as a lot would be learned. But remember that that particular process is one of resistance, developing resistance against the powerful world, which is what people were actually saying that you have not identified. The vested interests have not been identified. That's what actually I think the concern was. Right through in the hall. Right through. And it, it has happened also because of the fact that you are really going back to the same again. Without even identifying the force of change. And without even identifying how the failures and successes of the various forces of change which have worked on the ground. What they have, uh, what they want. How would they, they, when they have been pursuing many of these agenda goals, let me tell you that, the new agenda that they have been pursuing. They have learned a lot of lessons and I think there should be a full workshop. If a new manifesto has to come out, one, you have to identify the enemy, very clearly. The enemy? Yes, there is. There is an enemy within us and there is an enemy outside. Hmm? And the resistance and hegemony are really to fight both. Enemy outside as well as enemy within. But the enemy is always inside. Enemy is always inside <laughs> according to Renji. And uh, he's been my old colleague and now become a director of a new institution. And uh, that's the diversity that uh, we pursue. And you have to recognize that there is a diversity. There are conflicts of uh, ideas and so on, etc. And I'm sure Renji thinks that uh, hierarchies are not there. We think hierarchies are there. We think it's a very unequal world. You know, we think it's a very unequal world, this Delhi, huh, in which we live, huh, etc. So that, uh, that apart, you know, you let those debates take place at the, the world, take place at the world level, in the theatre of the world, uh, and they take place here locally as well. Recognize that. Then you can build a new vector. You can build a new force of change. That vector which would bring about, hopefully, what you really actually think. You think the top, with the bottom up, without development of user capabilities, which you have rightly identified as one of the major challenge, we have a reasonable amount of experience, what does that process entail? How is that is resistance and hegemony are really part of that building even user capabilities and the user's ideas and user support and the innovation and the innovation how they get embedded. I would say, let's get together 
not in this particular format. You wanted to divide us into two groups. You wanted us to talk to each other as neighbor. I'm telling you, recognize as full participants yeah, and that, partners. He should have been chairing this session. Yeah, yeah uh, maybe Ranjit could have chair, been chairing the session as well. Uh, as co-chair. And we could have worked together. We could have worked together. Okay. And I'm saying this precisely. No, Ranjit, one second. I didn't interrupt you when you were speaking. I kept quiet even five times when you spoke. And I think we recognize your old colleague. Uh, let, let, the be, huh? let the neighbors decide. Let the neighbors decide. Love your neighbor, yeah. Huh? Uh, that Jesus Christ said it, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, the, the point I think one needs to recognize is the missing elements, missing links must be identified frankly. You have, after starting with the thing, innovation is political, you have missed out on politics completely. You have missed out on the carriers, the forces of change, the resistance, and, the, and how to break the hegemony of the powerful. Those political processes are nowhere there. Your things is put in an extremely neutral manner. Forget about the past. My friends have very cr critically put how this is itself evolution. And you know, you must understand the forces which have brought about this disaster and the damage to the world which is called capitalism. You, you have not even used the word anywhere. Dinesh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to stop it. The silences speak. Yeah, yeah, silence words speak. chosen eclectically yeah. and put in there, as I was saying earlier, that look, the framework has not changed. Your framework of analysis remains what it was, as he was pointing out, by not recognizing all these movements, not only in India, China, etc., but even in Britain, even in Paris. There are plenty of examples. <coughs> plenty of examples. Ultimately, what you end up doing then, by referring to the 1970 manifesto, Dinesh, if you remember that old book by Michael Adders, Machines as a Measure of Men, you are taking you know, the percentage of GDP given to this as a measure of civilizations. And that is the problem. The missing framework, by not challenging the framework itself. In case we can spend some time, saying, because I know some very well-intentioned academics are behind this particular move, and I know some of them personally. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think we need to spend some time, how do we take it for, uh, further, in which way we can take it further. The people sitting here are very competent also, let me tell you that. Hmm? I believe you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I've been silent. I mean, I, I, I must confess, I really have so how can we be constructive right exactly. now? We yeah. spend some time so do we do it now, right away? Do you have some suggestions or before we eat or after we eat or what? Yes. Because it's a wonderful capacity in this room here. And I know that people are very well intentioned and stuff. Very well intentioned, there's no doubt about that. And you know, they've, 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 had, they've had interesting meetings in the UK. So how do we go forward now in terms of this amazing capacity here in the room? So uh, I'm very interested in what people have been saying because um, I've been tangentially involved in this project, and you started off saying, it doesn't work. This, this. It's technology, you know, it just doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> you started off saying, tell us your problems, and, and you know, we have our own problems, okay. and they're different to yours, obviously. Okay. But, but, well, some of it, yeah. But what strikes me really about this meeting is that all the kinds of things you've been saying about the manifest are exactly the kinds of things we all individually try to write and work against in our day-to-day -day academic work, which is fascinating. It's a question of how hegemony has reproduced us in a way that works entirely against what we set out to do or aim to do. And that's, that's a fascinating process in itself. Um, so I think that the comments, and, and is that a process of busy academics trying to group work and group think? How, do, how does that happen? How do, how does politics get nuanced out of a document that sets out to be political? It's, it's a fascinating question that I'm going to examine. So I'm really fascinated by what everyone has said in this room today. And, and, and you've set us a huge challenge. Can we nuance them back in? In group work is, is a massive challenge. And, and I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly small player in the steps of manifesto. I don't know if we can do that. So the bigger question is exactly what you're saying. How how do we face with our completely manic and crazy academic lives, which I'm, I know is similar for some of you, how do we manage to bring that together and produce this kind of document that, that does do something and does try, at least aspires to change the world in a way that's meaningful, is, is the question. It is not always what we call mumbo-jumbo and superstition. Their understanding of nature 
like uh, this Andaman, Nicobar Islands, this Sumani, uh, we do not have the humility even to recognize our illiteracy, how we read the weather. Uh, many of the anthropologists who work in Andaman, they went after tsunami, thinking that all the population must have been dead now because they were so close to the coast and they found not a single soul was uh, uh, damaged. And how come? Because they said, we know how to read the weather and we saw the rats and the birds and so we moved away to safer places. So, the, uh, we, we do not have even our, uh, you know, uh, meteorological departments do not have the humility to record this fact properly. So, this inequality in uh, knowledge systems, this uh, swara, first we must recognize the kind of knowledge genocide which uh, this uh, modernity has done in their respective societies, whether in Europe or all other continents. And second, this documentation of that genocide and whatever still is living has to be understood. And third, uh, regarding this would be, uh, for example, uh, in Western Rajasthan, every 12 kilometers the eco zone is different and the nuance is captured by only those who have not been to a school even the younger generation, though once they go to school, they lose that, that knowledge because that is part of the superstition in our vocabulary and they, uh, the knowledge system of indigenous variety is so diffident about it, it cannot uh, face the challenge of uh, modernist uh, uh, consumer paradise which all of us are uh, chasing in a catastrophic way. So, uh, democracy in the knowledge systems, the genocide in the knowledge systems, documentation of living knowledge systems which we don't recognize as knowledge systems, these are three other issues which need to be incorporated, penultimate to the process of calling our thing as many, the manifesto or a manifesto, uh, that would be a prerequisite. I was thinking is that uh, whenever we use words, like the sustainability, the equality, or the justice part of it. Uh, uh, from good houses like yours, who have gone through uh, in, a, in a lot of uh, uh, different papers and academics part of it. Uh, as I'm, I'm a part of, uh, in, in why using certain words in relation to the child welfare, there are 10 or 20 words which are not supposed to be used while I'm part of the child welfare committee. So we don't use certain words while writing, while making the of the future of a child. Uh, from your good houses, uh, could we also draw whichever the manifesto? Because uh, whoever draws manifestos, everybody has the right to bring on their own manifestos part of it. But while using some words, uh, they should mean this, otherwise they should not be used. Could we have some understanding of that nature? Because it's quite tricky, because when somebody says, we mean it. My basic question comes, are they really serious about it? So, uh, man, I just wanted to think along uh, and help me to understand this. While people use words, I'm, I'm requesting them to use it. Are they really serious about it? Yeah, beneficiaries of a profession like child health, uh, if certain categories of words are you know, uh, uh, proscribed as not to be used, it's understandable. But the kind of manifesto we are talking about is already so complicated in the fact that you know it, it's dealing with a large world, an equal world, where you know uh, some interested uh, 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 progressive think tanks, which are operating within the same framework you know that we are trying to fight, are developing language where we make new allies in the fight, and also we we keep the engagement with the people who run the system. Right? You you want to deal with the government, you know that. They are the rascals who brought us to this situation. You want to deal with the donors. They are the ones who, who kept an unequal world continuously unequal. You have to deal with the industry which has you know, pushed itself through the, uh, through the force, what do you call it, the bulldozer of globalization as it were, into developing country markets. But you have to deal with them. So already the whole thing is so complicated that who will define who should use or not use what words? Who has that right to define? You know, unless you know somebody sits at the top. Within a small professional group, it's easier to do that. In an exercise like this, it's far more difficult. Unless you already you know clearly define a certain political position, and then most people who agree to this political position 
are more likely to not use certain terms or are more likely to use certain terms or qualify them in a certain way. Once the, the political framework is defined, a lot of other things start getting defined. But then that would only be for the exercise of um, a few activists connecting to other activists. Let's accept the truth as it, as it happens that you create a political framework or ideological framework to connect uh, other like-minded people as a part of a movement, as a part of a, you know, a building a larger um, coalition for action of whatever sort it might be. Uh, but when you want to deal with, engage with government, engage with industry, engage with donors, uh, there is a you know, problem of articulating these things, which is probably the uh, difficulty that the Coding Sex Sussex are facing. And I understand because Prabhu has gone through a lot of difficulties over time. Disconcerted to see, I think in your email, that we were warned that whatever we may say may not finally enter the final document. So I am prepared to stay till 5 in the morning. But I don't want to find that having stayed till 5 in the morning, not a word of that is reflected in the final document. So we will certainly help you to take it forward. But I don't think it will be done today. We, you know, we can have an enjoyable discussion <coughs> after dinner. But I don't think that we will really be prepared to, as you've already got that proviso, uh, and I'm glad you put it in, so that I, I certainly came warned <laughs> that that was going to be so. But uh, there has to be some other way of doing it. I think with some minimum of 15 or more round tables that ideas it's impossible to take on every single thing that everybody says and it may contradict and so what one way of highlighting different views that we've and we anticipate using is through multimedia version of the manifesto which will link to recordings from roundtables or quotes from individuals um, as much as we can um, but I very much appreciate this willingness to engage, which I think is the real ground behind this project. I, I just have is a verification just, home, home. If I could just finish one point, is just that the aim is really to create more dialogue and discussion about and create more shared learning. Um, so, thank you. I just have your, a verification. Your colleagues who helped in writing the report shouldn't say, oh, this is a group of third world lefties. Leave them to talk, what, you know, say what they like. We don't want that to happen. No, but they are radical themselves. Already granted. <laughs> I find this uh, two-hour uh, discussion, uh, you know, being organized around a major uh, issue like new manifesto for science, technology, uh, uh, development as quite inadequate. Hmm? Uh, and, and she wrote back to me, people are going to be tired. It's going to be done at the end of another workshop, which is very urban uh, um, hey, work that you are doing. Uh, see, uh, this, I think one needs to give time when we want to really, uh, uh, that certainly is one requirement and I think I hope you have taken note of it because people are wanting to say things but and wanting to carry the discussion further but uh, we, have the, we have our limits. Number two, I think uh, 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 I, we participated in another part of the workshop of steps uh, where Sheila Jasnov, Andy, uh, you know, very many, Isha Shah, all of them had come. It was a, a British council that also organized next day uh, something. But you know, uh, we must uh, uh, bring out summaries of uh, these, these workshops, send it back to the participants, so as the, a process of dialogue can continue, you know. And I think same thing should be done here also. Uh, that's at least the first one minimum requirement that I uh, would insist. The second is, I think, uh, we should be jointly working. It's, uh, you know, when I say jointly working, when I say, okay, fine, then involve, identify individuals who are taking interest, then let, uh, invite them to even write working papers, put them on your websites. That is absolutely welcome. Uh, uh, do that. If uh, Kaplansky can write a, a, a piece, uh, a, you know, and he's written a very good piece uh, on the manifesto and so on. So there's so many other from Indian experience can also write and so on, etc. I tell you how the manifesto was received, the Sussex manifesto was received there. That would be uh, we, very... We can talk about that, actually, manifesto, because we grew with that. Uh, from early 70s onwards and so on, etc., with that particular whole debate which was going on in this country. So there's a lot of expertise around the world and I hope, uh, this is not to say that you are not inclusive, but I think your process must become 
Uh, intentionally you are inclusive, that's why you are holding a round table, but let the process also become, uh, you know, the, such that we can devote all and contribute to your process uh, in effective manner. At the moment we feel little, you know, inadequate. I think two and a half hours, have we really, you know, achieved what we wanted to achieve through this interaction? Mm. That's all. And it's in a very, it's not a criticism of the kind that should disappoint you, yeah. but I think only should encourage you to, uh, let's next time that how we can do it together better. And we are holding one of the round tables earlier here and the format that we are uh, following is having marginalized women, we work with marginalized women, so we are having workshops followed with round tables uh, with marginalized women groups. Young, one group is young Muslim women in the region from Umbra in Maharashtra. Another one is Konkan region where people are working on issues of energy and displacement. Uh, we think of not the third group in Pune, which uh, with the garbage workers at the Katsara Kangbar Panchayat, and maybe a Dalit group in Delhi. And uh, we would like to engage these people in their own understandings of science, technology, and development for their lives and represent their voices in this entire debate. <coughs>